So when it comes to running at 10 minute miles versus running at five minute miles, I think you'll agree they're very, very different things, not least when it comes to your running form. Running technique when we're running at those faster paces versus running at a slow, easy, long run pace feels very different, it looks very different, and it needs to be coached in, in somewhat different ways. We need to have the different kind of tools to be able to master our running technique at any different pace. Problem is, a lot of the advice we're given centers around elite runners, kind of deconstructing what elite runners are doing and trying to apply it to runners who perhaps, you know, more like you, more like me, we're out there running anywhere between, I don't know, seven minute miles through to 12 minute miles. It's not always appropriate. So today I want to look at what we can do at 10 minute miles. So a really common kind of long run pace, which again, is just as appropriate if you're running 12 minute miles and start to start to think about various different cues, various different tips we can utilize to actually hold our techniques together better as we're running long, slow, and easy. So the first thing that I know a lot of us will be really familiar with is how posture begins to fall apart as we start to get tired. And this is something that, again, I think is just fundamental to running form, whether we're talking you know, sprint form or whether we're talking real slow, steady, ultra running form. Posture is the basis of everything else. So a lot of the time though, when we get tired, let's say last third of a long run, if we're marathon training, see a lot of people who end up in this kind of shoulders rounded forward, slight chin poke, butt sticking out type position, and they're there just kind of getting it done. Legs are tired, lower backs feeling it, quite tight through the shoulders, not really heart and lungs, not really working particularly hard. You know, hopefully the pace is appropriately easy, but it's just time on the feet. It's just taking it out of their body. Problem with this position, we'll talk about the tight shoulders later, but with this rounded forwards, chin poke type posture, the hips going back to compensate, anterior tilt of the pelvis, arch of the lower back to compensate, it puts those glutes in a position where it's actually really hard for them to effectively do what they're meant to do while they're running, particularly when it comes to stabilizing the pelvis and creating a good strong push off. Now, we can help rectify that, not by thinking about trying to you know, directly posture, uh, directly pelvically tilt in the other direction. Instead, I want to think about what's happening up here, correct this, it'll all automatically help to sort out how you're holding yourself around here. So, the cue I give people is to think about, firstly, just gently drawing their chin back so the head is squarely on top of shoulders. So rather than being here, it's back in. And then thinking about running with a long neck. Obviously, we can't, as humans, extend our necks upwards. But what we can do is think about that visualization of lengthening our neck, which forces us to drop our shoulders. So if we've got a, ten if we've got a tendency to be up here with our shoulders and feel very tight through our traps, thinking about running with a long neck will naturally cause that slight depression of the shoulders, that lowering of the shoulders. Doing that naturally puts you in a position where you're going to be far more centered in terms of the weight of your head on top of your spine. From there, thinking about shoulders back and down helps to put us in a position where rather than being rounded forwards, we're nicely open in terms of our chest. And that in turn will stop any need for us to stick our butt out in compensation because this usually is in compensation for the, the weight here coming forwards. So drawing back here naturally puts you in a good place here. If we're now in this position, a simple thought of hips up and forwards as we're running, not forcing it, we're not here, but gently hips up and forwards will put you in a position where it's much easier to then use those glutes, you'll feel stronger, you'll feel like you're managing to land closer to, or hold your hips closer to over the top of the landing foot, which is the direction in which we're trying to, to move your posture. So as you get tired, hold those things in mind. How am I holding my upper body? Where is that gonna put the rest of me? The next thing I want to think about is what it feels like underfoot. And think back to, again, think back to a long run, a point where you're tired, where it starts to feel that you're getting heavy underfoot. Okay, it gets a little bit ploddy, gets a little bit labored. Now at that point, if you can imagine that, you don't need to look at your watch to know that your cadence is starting to drop. That heaviness really is the, the manifestation of, of a longer contact time. 
Okay, so your foot's on the ground for marginally longer. With the foot being on the ground for marginally longer, naturally the leg becomes a little bit less stiff, you get a little bit less spring out of the leg, it all feels a little bit more spongy, and it's gonna feel just a little bit more, the best word I have for it is ploddy. Now, easiest way to correct that is to think about your cadence. At that point, think about making short, quick strides. Now, what we don't need to do is take advice that we see all over the internet and magazines and books, etc., and shoot for 180 strides per minute. Because quite frankly, for a lot of us, that's just not realistic or helpful and won't be efficient or effective. That figure was derived from, again, looking at elite runners, not understanding what John or Jane or you or me, runner on the street, actually do. So let's say naturally, if you're doing your tempo workouts or your, your interval sessions, let's say if you hit kind of mid 170s, because cadence should scale up and down with pace slightly. So let's say if you're in that place where you're hitting mid 170s on those harder, more intense workouts, it's probably true that as you drop to the kind of the 10 minute mile pace, it's gonna feel about right for you to be hitting about 170 strides per minute in terms of your cadence. For those who aren't familiar, cadence is stride frequency, the number of steps you make per minute, usually expressed in counting both left and right at the same time. So 180 would be 90 on the left, 90 on the right. So instead of trying to artificially push the number up to hit a, uh, a fairly uh, arbitrary goal, like 180, just think about, right, how low is my cadence dropping when I get tired? Those of you who have cadence on a watch and you can look back at your data, perhaps look at some of your long runs and see what happens to your cadence. Does it tail off a little? We're just talking probably like, I don't know, between you know, three to 5% as you get tired. But is it tailing off to the point where you're starting to feel that it's getting heavy and ploddy? Because at that point, thinking about, again, holding hips high and then making short, quick strides rather than allowing yourself to get ploddy will make everything just a little bit more efficient. Now, the problem with cadence and stride length is that when you're trying to maintain a given pace, so let's say 10 minute miles, and your cadence drops, the way you make up for that is by increasing your stride length or slowing down. But if you're trying to maintain a given pace, then increasing your stride length is the answer. It's not a good answer, but it's the answer our bodies kind of default to. And the way we do that most of the time, if we're, let's think about everything so far, we're in this kind of bad posture here, we're starting to over, sorry, our cadence is starting to drop a little bit, I've kind of given the game away there, our cadence is starting to drop a little bit, we start to overstride and throw the lower leg too far out in front of our body as we come to hit the ground. Usually that comes with a heel strike, but it can also be that people come and do the same with a forefoot strike, I mean, that's just, that's just calf problems and Achilles problems waiting to happen, but it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, firstly, keeping your cadence under control will stop this whole thing from happening in the first place. But also, as you're trying to increase your stride length, the way your body should be doing it is by picking the knee up a little bit more, picking the foot up a little bit more underneath you and dropping that foot under a flexing knee. And I don't mind whether you're heel striking or whether you're midfoot striking, but as long as it's happening under a flexing knee, we're allowing this shock absorbing mechanism to come into play. The, natural, the, the body's got a natural shock absorber there, a natural shock absorbing mechanism there through knee flexion, ankle dorsiflexion, flexion, hip flexion as the foot strikes the ground. But when we're here, it can't be as efficient in that system. So we end up in a position where we're experiencing far more decelerative force coming back at us, ankle, knee, hip, lower back is gonna feel that, but also it's efficient because it's slowing, it's inefficient because it's slowing us down and we've got to overcome that. So I'd much rather when you start to feel that your legs are getting tired and they're dragging underneath you and cadence is starting to drop, much rather you think about just gently picking your foot up and placing, picking your foot up and placing, rather than dragging through underneath. It doesn't, need to suddenly look like you're running in place doing that. That would be stupid. That would look stupid, that would feel stupid, and you'd just be like that. That would be the nail in the coffin in terms of hamstring cramp. Instead, just think about ever so slightly, like one, two percent more picking your foot up than you would do previously. Because if you just get to that point where you're picking the knee up a little bit more, 
then it's gonna be easier to drop that foot underneath the flexing knee than it would be if the knee stayed real low and you're throwing the lower leg out in front. Big difference between those two things. Visually, it doesn't look like much. Visually, it doesn't feel, look like much of a difference. Intrinsically, it'll feel like more of a difference than it visually looks. The last thing, working back up to the top, is actually thinking about what's going on around the shoulders, your neck, and the tension through there, and even the hands, the tension through the upper body. A lot of runners, when they get into this kind of, again, tired, hunched type position, they get real tight through, it's a lot of time, again, like I say, it starts with their hands, they're, they're here, they get tight through their shoulders, and the arms almost clamp to their upper body, and they're kind of here as they're running. Now, what actually happens in terms of the arms, whether we're able to maintain a back and forth movement or there's more rotation there, or we've got this weird kind of mixing bowl type action we see with some people, that's actually an expression of what's happening from a control perspective elsewhere in the body. And there's a video on my channel that I'll link to in the description that goes through that in more detail. But what I want you to consider is whether you're managing to get into that long neck position we were talking about earlier, keep the shoulders nice and relaxed and keep an active swing back and forth, but really focusing on the back, 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 back aspect of that swing, because the, the rhythm of the arms will help dictate the rhythm of the legs. These two are intrinsically linked. So if we keep the arms moving, it'll help keep the legs turning over. Keep the hands loosely grasped. We don't need to tense up. We don't need tight fists, but hands loosely closed, and then just focus on keeping that movement going because that movement will help keep everything else relaxed and will help keep you efficient. Now, I said earlier that studying elite runners and trying to um, pull out what they're doing isn't always super appropriate, super effective in terms of us runners, but there's a really good video right over here which talks about Elliot Kipchoge's arm action, and that is one aspect that I think will really help you getting your arm action right, keeping this efficient but effective if you follow what's in this video, it'll change a great deal in your running. Right, I'll see you over there in the next one.